As I stood in the shallows, the angel of the Lord measured off a distance, and there were waters to my knees. Again he measured and took me to waters to my waist. A third time, he measured and took me to waters so deep I could swim. Life isn't meant to be lived in the shallows. It's only a pathway to the deep. Hey, Covenant Church. Good to see you this morning. How are you? Good? We got some energy up in here or what? I'm glad to be home. Sometimes when we get home, we're just, we feel at home. It's a little warm in here and it's usually freezing. I'm cold all the time, so I have my blanket, but it's cold outside. We can get sort of a little bit like our energy reserves for ourselves, but I'm glad to be here today and uh, I hope you're glad to be in the house of the Lord today. Um, I've had a busy fall. I had to fulfill some speaking engagements that I had committed to previously uh, before I said yes to McKinney. And so I'm done with those. Hallelujah. So they were good, thank God. But uh, I'm here every Sunday now. So I'm excited about that. So if I'm here, I want you here. And I'm talking to everyone watching online right now that has their feet open, just looking at the screen through their feet. Um, laying in bed, we want you here too. We need your energy here, and uh, this is a great community church, and we love one another. We love to be in the presence of the Lord. Something unexpected always happens. Uh, whatever it is that we need, He's here to meet our needs, to fill us back up, and that's a beautiful thing. Amen? Good. Well, I'm glad to be here with you. I love this series. I'm excited about uh, the deep, and so we're talking about the shallows. It's our entrance into the deep. So however deep we want to go in the things of God, we can't despise the beginning or the small things or the shallows because that got us into the deep, right? Last week, our senior pastor, Pastor Stephen, brought the vision for this message and he talked about the danger in being in the shallows, finding yourself living in that shallow place um, where we get cut off, we can get isolated, we can get sort of battered around by the waves. And there is a reason and a purpose in the deep. There's benefits of going deep in the things of God. We base this series off of 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 12. I'm going to read that to you and then we're just going to dive in. Is that okay? All right, straight to the deep end. Is that all right? Okay, sink or swim today. <laughs> However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. Can we get an amen? amen. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God, for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. So this takes us through basically a, a scale of immaturity spiritually to maturity, it starts out talking about uh, the things that can only be understood, the mysteries of God as we mature, but it really points out something powerful and practical for us. As it says in verse 9, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and it has not even entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for those who love him. So what does that mean to me? That means that this spiritual source this verse talks about is not going to come from something I see online, 
not from something I hear from someone else, and it's not even going to originate in an idea in my heart. It doesn't come from me. It doesn't come from the world. It doesn't come from the shallows. The things of God, the deep things of God, come from the deep place of the Spirit of God. So this whole sermon series, the, the power in it, and I hope the challenge in it that you find is this, is when we are caught up in whatever's going on in the world, it's opinions, it's vices, it's addictions, it's troubles, it's worries, it's burdens, it's concerns. I cannot receive the deep things God has prepared for me from any of those sources. That's not going to come from there. My future, my hope, my peace, my joy, none of that is going to come from my eyes or my ears or my heart. I'm going to receive the deep thing of God, the resource of the Spirit, from the Spirit of God. That's the only place. And let me tell you, when you get in with the world and you, you're troubled, because the same troubles that fall in the world fall on us. But we have the option of a different outcome because we have the option of a different source. We don't have to run out when everybody else runs out. I hope this message really challenges you to desire the deep because there's a fear associated with deep things. And, and we have a saying, you know, somebody is so spiritually minded, they're no earthly good. Have you ever heard that before? Well, I don't believe in those kind of messages. I've read a lot of verses for a lot of years that I could not apply at the time. I let it take root in my heart. I just dwelt on it. I meditated on it. I was in over my head, and I was good with that. I was safe knowing there's no way I can misinterpret this. I don't even understand it. But it's okay because I was made for this. My DNA, your DNA, we were spoken into being with the very voice and word of God. So the word of God here is what created you. It is the lifeblood, it is the DNA of what you are made of. You were made to understand the Bible because you're made from the very word of God. You get that? The world around you tries to tell you that's too deep for you, stay out of it. And there's a fear attached to things we can't control and things we can't understand. But getting lost in the word of God is, is being found in the will of God. It's, it's a joy. I, I've never really had a lot of fears. Mom and I were talking about that last week. I think I get that from my mother. Um, but as a child, when we were first in, at Josie Place Apartments, we first moved to Carrollton. My parents moved here to start Covenant Church. I was two years old. And we lived at Josie Place for a while until the Lord opened a door for us to be able to buy, buy a house. It was really miraculous. It was uh, a little uh, house on the corner with a big swimming pool and houses that were built in the 70s. If you know anything about houses or were raised in a house in the 70s, the bedrooms were big, you know, and the pools were big and the pools were deep. So our pool was 10 feet deep on the deep end and the shallow end was four feet deep. So there were stairs going down into the pool, but there was no like shallow end for little kids, like a beach entry where you sort of splash around. It was deep if you, and deep is relative, right? If, if depending on how mature you are, right? So if, if it's over your head, it's deep, no matter what the number on the side of the pool says. But I was uh, three and a half or four years old and I didn't have fear associated with water, the kind of fear I needed to have. And I raced around the pool, and I would, I would um, almost fall in right in front of my parents and just giggle and laugh. And my dad got really tired of my grandma Hayes calling every single day about 10 times, making sure that they had a lock on the sliding glass door, that they had perimeters around so I couldn't get to the pool. She was terrified I was going to fall into the pool because my dad legitimately drowned on three occasions and was brought back. So as a child, she knew, you know, there, Amy is fearless. She's racing around this pool, and she would play it out in her mind all day. So finally my dad said, you know, I'm tired of worrying about this. So what he does is he decides uh, his, you know, elevated swim lessons. He decides to throw me in. 
He's like, I want to see how she would respond if I weren't here, except I am here. So he threw me in, and I looked at him, I remember, through the bubbling water as I'm in over my head thinking, I thought this man loved me. He's trying to kill me. I, I felt like I almost died that first time. He pulled me up out of the water, sputtering and coughing and crying and looking at him sort of out the side of my eye like, I thought you loved me. And then he, he got me calmed down. He explained to me again how I did know how to doggy paddle. I did know how to tread water. And if I had my little, we called it an eggy, but it was an egg that would strap from my back. It was a flotation device. They said, if you had your egg on, you know that it would hold you in the right position to do this. So without the egg, I need to know that you will start swimming if you fall in. Swim lessons now, if you've taken your kids, it's very similar. The first level of swim lessons is they want to make sure that they can turn over on their backs, so they can breathe and get to the side. And the way they pass their final exam for the first phase of teaching a child to swim that's under three is they, they make you fully dress that child and bring them to that last swim lesson and they push them in the water dressed because most children drown because their clothes are so heavy and they've never had to endure that adversity to get out. So my dad, he was on to something. He wasn't abusive, so don't worry about that. He was on to something. He was, he was into saving my life. And he realized I, I'd never gone under. I'd always had this device on, and I needed a healthy fear about being in over my head. And how, what was I going to do? How was I going to respond? How was I going to survive that? So the second time he threw me in, I was like a spider monkey. I was not even going to let go of him no matter what. I think I pulled all his chest hair out trying to make sure that I, I didn't get hit that water. But he, he threw me in the second time, and I swam the second time. It was in me. The knowledge was there. But he had to put me in a sink or swim environment in order to bring that out of me. right? And he wanted to see if it would come out or if I would panic. So I learned how to swim. They called me a fish. I swam all the time from then on. Never had an issue. Our kids, we all taught them how to swim very, very young, and uh, we never had an issue. We just, in our family, we, don't, we didn't deal with water in like we're just going to avoid it and ignore it. No, we're like, that is a danger. There needs to be the right kind of fear attached to it, but we also need to equip and prepare them. We have someone in our family who's terrified of water. She'll sit in the lawn chair. She won't put on a bathing suit. She won't get near the water. She doesn't even want water on her face when she takes a bath because she's scared of drowning. So uh, she has a fear of water. And I always want to ask her, where did that come from? But then I think of the movie where the guy said, I had a bad experience. <laughs> uh, she had a bad experience somewhere in her life. And it scarred her. There's a fear of the deep. Well, there is a fear of the deep when it comes to the deep things of God. We often think, you know what, I can understand a little, I'll stay in the shallow end, but when it comes to the deep things, I'm going to leave that to people who go to Bible school. I'm going to leave that to the pastors or to the elders or to my small group leader. But you were made for the deep, and there are benefits of the deep. There are dangers staying in the shallow end. That's not where we're supposed to stay. It leads us to the deep, but we're supposed to be led there. So I want to talk about the purposes of the deep. The first one is progress in the deep. These are things that happen in the deep that don't happen in the shallow places in relationship with God. In the story of Jesus and the disciples taken from John chapter 6, I'd like to read this for you, 16 through 21. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water. And they were frightened, but he said to them, It is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Say immediately. That's the key in this verse, and it really takes us to the idea of progress in the deep. 
I said to you earlier, you know, we go through the same things people who have no covenant with God endure. You know, we get bad diagnosis. We have relationship issues. We have to pay bills just like people who don't believe. But the difference is when we endure a storm as a disciple and we are in the middle of it, we are struggling with the oars, we're battling the wind, we're battling the waves, just like the disciples, we have the same option of inviting Jesus into the boat where we are, into the middle of the storm, into the middle of the struggle, we have that option. People that don't have a relationship with him simply get stuck struggling for year upon year with the same things, same addictions, same vices, same relationship obstacles. But we have the option of seeing him and saying, he's right here. I have a relationship with him. I want to be afraid, but I realize I need to be willing to invite him into this situation. He's here, but he's not going to come in uninvited. Maybe I went ahead of him. Maybe I brought this upon myself. It really doesn't matter. Asking all those questions and describing the reason for the waves, the reason for the strong wind, the reason for exhaustion and the struggle, that is irrelevant. If Jesus is here, invite him into the situation and ask him to come into the boat. And what happens immediately when he comes into the boat? They arrive at their destination. I've been to the Sea of Galilee. It's enormous. There's a reason it's called a sea. You, go, you can't see to the other side, can you? And so when you're in the middle, three or four miles in, and you've been struggling doing it on your own. See, so many of us as believers, we do that because we watch the world around us and we think we are obligated to endure the same struggles. We're obligated to believe that racial reconciliation is going to take generations and generations because it took us generations to get here. No, God says, if you invite me into the storm, into the boat, into the struggle, I will get you where you want to go very quickly. You don't have to wait like the world does. You don't have to keep struggling like they are. When you're in the middle of the storm, yes, it, it may be hard. Your endurance may be out. But if you will recognize I'm present, you are in relationship with me, don't be afraid. Ask me to come into this situation. What does that look like? Because this is all good and it can sound good on Sunday, but we go back to life and then we're like, what does inviting Jesus into my boat look like? Well, maybe it looks like not talking about the height of the waves because I'm telling you, when Jesus enters the conversation, the conversation changes because everything that he can change, which is everything, is under his feet. Amen? Everything is under his feet. The Bible says we're seeing everything come into alignment under the power and the will of God. So if Jesus is in the boat, then I'm safe because he's here with me. And that trust, that peace that comes from that invitation means I'm going to stop describing the struggle. I'm going to put down my oars. I'm going to stop trying to do it all by myself. I have a God who bent down over the earth and decided to descend into my story, to step into my storm. And what an insult is that to him for us to struggle on our own, to pay bills we can't pay, to struggle on our own, to try to redeem relationships we can't fix in the natural. It's time for you to put down the oars and allow God to bring progress in the deep and to get you to your place of arrival, to bring you through that storm with a quickness. I've lived it in my life. There are things that I've been through, some things I brought upon myself through my own sin and my own mistakes, and some things that just came upon me were just trials I had to walk through. And in every one of those cases, I can look back and I can see people who endured very similar storms, almost exact storms. And instead of it derailing my life like it could have, and I see that it did them, I decided in those moments to lean into the deep, 
to not be afraid of the place God had led me to, but to lean into it, to realize being in over my head is going to allow me to accept and receive a miracle few people get to receive and see, is to lean into it and say, God, I know you're doing something here. I'm going to stop fighting the waves. I'm going to stop fighting the wind. You brought me here for a purpose, and it wasn't to let me drown in the middle. It was to get me across because there is purpose. There are miracles. There are people. There are needs on the other side of this struggle. And when I look back at things like I got pregnant when I, we were engaged, I got pregnant with my first child, and that was so out of character for me. I was just a prude teenager, never really dated, let alone anything else. And it was something I didn't understand God allowed, even though I made the mistake. I, I had friends that were promiscuous and had been for years, and it, they, didn't, they weren't pregnant. And I really dealt with that struggle. I was battling those waves, everybody's opinion. I felt like I was in the middle and out there all by myself. And I remember Jesus showing up for me and saying, Amy, what I've called you to, you could have never gotten there with the judgmental spirit you've had. This idea that you've had that if you never made a mistake as a teenager, that qualified you to minister, I'm sorry, but that's not the qualifications I use. <laughs> See, the Lord taught me in the deep place that we're born into sin and we're shaped in iniquity. I thought keeping myself out of relationships, keeping myself per perfect was the way to serve God. And, and God... He stepped into my boat and I said, I don't know where you're going. I don't know how this is going to work out. But if you drew me here, then you're, you're drawing me to the other side. And I'm going to invite you into this situation. You take me where you mean to take me. I give it to you. We got to invite him into our boat and not say, no, God, let me clean this up. I made this mess. He's saying, no, I'm right here. And you can choose to keep being afraid or you can invite me in. And immediately you'll be brought out of this situation. You don't have to reap for year after year after year. And see, I can talk about the story of getting pregnant before I was married now. And there's no sting attached to it because I know it was the making of me. Because I leaned into the deep. I didn't fight it. I put down the oars and I said, you know what, God, I don't know what you're doing. But if you'll step in the boat, I trust you. Take me somewhere I've never seen. Because right now what my eyes tell me, what my ears tell me, even what my heart tells me is that I don't have a future after this. But do you remember what I read to you? No eye has seen. No ear has heard. And it has never entered into your heart. The source I'm giving you, Amy, is not going to come from somebody else's opinion of this situation. If you'll lean into the grace, get in over your head, drown in the grace of God right now, you're going to have an encounter with grace that will change you forever. And you, you couldn't, see the way the Lord showed me is I couldn't have ministered to any of you the way I was before that situation. Because I would, my teaching to you would be, Keep yourself away. Basically, lock yourself up like a monk. Turn off your phone. Separate yourself from the world. Because up until that point, that's what had worked for me. I thought that was holy. And God showed me a picture and said, Amy, this is the map of your life. And I could never get you where I've called you until you encountered a drowning by grace. Your will had to drown. Your way had to drown. You had to invite me into the boat and realize this isn't about your works. This is about where I've intended to take you. So whatever the boat in your life right now, you don't have to be stuck in the middle of the, of the sea struggling. With the quickness, immediately, the Bible says, once they invited him into the situation, they arrived. You can be on the other side of that storm. Provision happens in the deep. This is one of my favorite stories. It's, it takes place again in the Sea of Galilee, but this is when Jesus encounters Peter, who was Simon, who'd come back from a night of not catching any fish at all. So Luke 5, 1 through 7 says this. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, 
The people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. That's in the shallows. Then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, this is Simon Peter, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. What a story. So let's go to the beginning where Jesus has a crowd around him, multitudes gathered. And he has no stage. He has no platform. So he gets this idea, well, if I step into that empty boat and we push away from shore just a little, it'll be like a stage. My voice will reverberate over the water and the crowd will be able to hear me. So he steps into an empty boat. Now, that may seem like not a point at all. But when we read the, the preceding verses where we know that Simon Peter has just come back from a night of failure, that empty boat means a little bit more than just an opportunity for a platform. It's a place of failure. If I were Simon Peter, I'd be like, Jesus, I mean, can't you take your crowd just like a little on down the road? Like ease on that way? Because right now, coming in after a night of fishing... My failure is on display in front of all of these thousands of people. My empty boat. I'm a fisherman who cannot catch a fish. I'm washing all the debris and the dirt and the trash out of my nets, and you're drawing a limelight. You're drawing attention to the emptiness of my plight. How hard would that be for you and I? Next week we're going to talk more about living in the in-between where we're, we have one foot in the shallows on the sand, one world, and one foot in the deep, and, the, and the, the trouble with that. You know, one of my sons told me, he said, Mom, did you know where the word sand comes from? And I said, no, and he said, it's just a combination of the word land and sea. I didn't know that. Did you all know that? So sand, where the Bible says, do not build your house upon the sand, is the border between two worlds. The deep place and the land, the safe place. Everybody knows how to walk. Everybody knows how to survive on the land. But when we're called into the deep, there is a portion of sand where the shallows are. That's the place Jesus chooses to teach the multitudes. The shallows are a place to teach. But that's the place where feelings happen. That's a place where we can get offended really easily. That's a place where the waves hit. Two worlds meet. And Jesus asked Peter, can you give me your empty boat and let me step in? It's another situation of stepping into the boat, into your situation. Is it failure? So he steps into the situation and he uses it as a platform and he preaches to the multitudes in the shallows. And then he says, for my disciples, this isn't for everyone. Everybody's not invited on this three-hour cruise but I am going to invite the disciples, those who are walking with me, because I'm going to move from just telling you what abundance is like to showing you. So Jesus says, Peter, would you push off into the deep? He calls them out to the deep, and Peter says, well, I can tell you that my experience is right now as a fisherman, I know you're a carpenter, I'm a fisherman, and my experience is there's nothing biting. But because you asked me to do it, I'll do it. See, sometimes when God asks us and draws us into the deep, into a time of prayer, into a time of setting ourselves apart, pushing away from the shore, the things we're sure about, launching into a deep place is a request he makes that doesn't make any sense to you or I. Sometimes we can say, no, there's, a, there's bills that need to be paid. There's things that need to be done. I don't have time 
to push into the deep, to launch out into the deep. God, this seems like a waste of time, but if you ask me to, I'll do it. And he did, and so he takes him out into the into the deep, and we see the end of the story is that the nets are breaking because there's such a harvest. There's so many fish. There's provision in the deep. If you will say yes to the cry, when deep calls out to deep, when the Spirit of God is nudging you and saying, you know, you could scroll for a couple more hours on Instagram, or you could pull out that Bible the DNA from which you were made, and you could hear something in the deep. You could receive something nobody else has. Because while everybody else is catching nothing, if you'll go to the deep with me and by my invitation, you'll have more than you could ever, ever carry. So much more that you're going to have to bring a community in to help you. See, God wants us to be great, but we can't be great on our own. So he's going he's gonna to place an abundance on you that's going to require other people come out to the deep to start taking part in what you're drawing up, what you're bringing forth. There's songs of deliverance in this place. There's songs of deliverance. There's stories that need to be written. There's books that need to be written. Things that need to be pulled up out of the deep that God is calling you to. Set your life aside right now and whatever failure you've had before and say yes to that provision. Whether you understand it or not, begin to start set, setting aside a time every day to be able to go deep in the Word of God. There's peace in the deep. You're not close to the opinions of man. It's quiet. You push out from all of those things. Do you know, if you have a boat and a storm is coming, like a hurricane, you never want to harbor your boat by docking it during a storm. It seems safe, there's coverage, but it's actually not because a boat floats on the surface. And when waves come and when wind comes, if a boat is docked, it beats against its moorings, destroying it. So if you have a boat and you care about your boat and a storm is coming, then you go out into the deep and you anchor in the deep because there's nothing you're gonna bang up against when a storm comes. You're out there by yourself, it's quiet, but you're anchored, you're not docked. Hebrews says to us, Hebrews 6, 19 says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. And I want to tell you that maybe you have never really launched out into the faith walk, which is an in-over-your-head relationship with God. I'm going to ask you to consider doing that, leaving control behind and finding yourself anchored in a very deep place, away from the opinions, away from, you're not moved by surroundings, but you're anchored in something that is so deeper than the, than the temporary. And let me give you an example. If I am anchored in a deep place, then anything that's surface related is no longer relevant to me. Surface is moving. But at the depth, it's not moving. I'm held fast. And when I'm anchored in truth, facts are irrelevant. It doesn't mean I'm in denial. It just means those things are not moving me. If you're anchored in eternity, you're not moved by the temporary. If you're anchored in the love of God, you are not moved by public opinion. If you're anchored in the counsel of the Spirit, you're not moved by criticism. If you're anchored in the grace of God, you're not moved by judgment that the world judges by. If you're anchored in truth, you are not moved by facts. And what does that mean? I've walked this road. I've heard the worst thing you can hear in a doctor's office. And when I've sat there before, I'm going, okay, these are the facts, but I'm not docked. I'm anchored in a deep place. And because I'm anchored by eternity, I know that a God that loves me more than anyone else could gave his life. He suffered and died so I could be healed, 
So that is the truth I'm anchored in. And I'm anchored in the fact that if I go on to eternity, I get to meet the Apostle Paul before you do. I'm anchored in that truth. So whatever temporary thing comes against me, I'm not moved by that thing. I'm not beat up by that thing because I'm anchored in a deeper place. I hope I'm creating a hunger or thirst for you to get to a place. See, I wrote a Bible study a few years ago. I know I need to close, but it was called When Women Worship. And it took women through excavating something in your heart. And I wanna give you an example, a practical example of what this means to be anchored to the deep things. Is if you are really struggling with something in your life, it's bothering you, you know it's eating at you. When you go into your prayer and meditation, you pull that thing up into the light. You show it to the Lord and say, this is bothering me. Maybe it's a relationship struggle, whatever it is. Maybe it's a health issue. You bring it up, you pull it out of that deep place in the ground where it's been harbored. When you do, I'll give you an example for me, is when something that's spoken against my life has taken root and it's caused me to worry or concern about my future. And I can go about my day, but I realize I'm a little bit short-tempered because I'm worried. And then when I really get in the presence of the Lord and I say, okay, God, something's wrong here. Something is, is buried here and I, help me get it up. What is this lie? And I pull it up and I pull it out into the light and it's about my life and my future being in jeopardy. And then I look to the word of God and I say, okay, what is the, what's the word say? about my future. What's the Spirit of God say about my future? Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, to give you hope and a future. So I take that word and I put it down in the hole that I just pulled that other thing out of my heart. And when I put that word down in the deep place of my heart, then when the enemy comes in like a flood, the word of God raises up a standard against that lie in that place of darkness. That's what it means being anchored in the deep things of God. I don't want there to be any deep place in me that is working against what God is doing in my life because it will show on the surface, amen? And the last thing I wanna bring you is preparation in the deep. Whatever God takes us through in the spirit, is meant to prepare us for whatever we face in the natural. So when God takes you into the deep, maybe it's a struggle, an emotional struggle, maybe there's no words for what you're going through, the storm you're going through. Maybe you can't just put a label on it. Whatever it is, you know that resistance, you know that trial has been difficult for you and you look for purpose in it, we all do. I'm gonna tell you the greatest purpose in what God has brought you out into the deep for is to prepare you. Pastor Stephen told me this, he happens to be our brother as well, but he collects a lot of scientific facts. And he told me that the pressure for every hundred feet of flight is the same and equal to the pressure of just one foot below the surface of the water. So what that means is, is that when you go deep, dealing with the pressure deep helps you deal with the pressure of flying high. And you and I in our lives, our flesh, we desire to go up. Our goals are always upward and onward. But the Bible tells us in Ephesians 4.10 that Jesus came down, he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. And then it says this, now he ascended, which means to go up. What does it mean but that he also first descended into lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. He gave up, he was a sovereign and he gave that up to be a son and then to be a servant of mankind. He put himself lower than the angels, the Bible says. He stepped down into our story, he descended and he dealt with the pressures that we deal with here so that he can liberate us and prepare us for influence. You know the story I was just telling you about where Peter caught all the fish? You know what happened after that? He catches all the fish and then Jesus says to him, don't be afraid, Peter, from now on, you're gonna be fishing for men. 
And when he said that to Peter, it says that Peter and the disciples left everything on the shore and followed him. What God is doing with you in the deep is meant to prepare you for leadership, for influence. And he wants to take you to the deep place to show you who he is. So that one day, like Peter, you can stand at a gate like beautiful. And you can look at people and say, you know what? I don't have any silver and I don't have any gold. But what I do have, this deep relationship with God that produces the miraculous, I can give that to you. Because I've been to the deep place. I can share that with you. And I can endure whatever pressure of leadership comes against me. Stand with me. What I want to do right now is I feel like there are people that are just struggling against the oars. You're in the middle of a storm. You're looking for peace. You're looking for purpose in the deep, in the struggle, in the pain. God wants to speak peace to you right now. But I want to give you the opportunity to invite him into your boat. That boat might be in the middle of a storm. It might be on the edge of a shore and it might feel like failure. But you need peace. You need connection. You need to be anchored. If you want to receive that, just lift your hands. Father, I thank you right now for a hunger and for a thirst, for victory and purpose that only comes from the Spirit, the source that is you. We can't see our victory. We can't hear our victory. We can't feel our victory. We have to invite our victory into the boat. You are our victory. You wear the victor's crown. We give this battle to you, this storm, this situation, this struggle. We ask you, God, to do what only you can do. We yield in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for peace in the middle of the storm. We thank you for provision right now in the name of Jesus. And we thank you that you're preparing every heart and every life. God, that you're going to point out, even through this message, purpose in the pain and the struggle. There is purpose. Let us lean into the deep. Let us give it to you fully and wholly. In Jesus' name we pray. And we thank you for the peace that attends. In Jesus' name, amen.